Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second keynote session. Today's speaker is Professor Yang Lecun. Yang, it's such a great honor to have you here. Thank you. The talk today will be around, you know, for the less than an hour or so, and plus, you know, 15 minutes or so Q&A session. So actually during the talk, feel free to raise questions using the Q&A function, uh, which you can see that on the menu bar of Zoom. All right, Yan, I bet everyone here knows about you. So please just allow me to spare everyone your fantastic short bio. Everyone, you can feel free to read it on our website and longer versions are on Yan's personal website. But here, just allow me to reveal the lesser known identity of Yan. So besides being a Turing lawyer and a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, Yan is also a musician and a serious flute player. He even makes his own electronic wind instrument, which truly surprised me. Moreover, Yan is very passionate in computer music research, conceptualizing various of music problems using deep learning and trying to on the road of unifying computer music, CV and NLP problems under the self-supervised learning framework. And today, Yan will share his vision on fulfilling David Whistle's dream. Everyone, please welcome Yan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, guys and Margaret for inviting me uh, it's a real pleasure. This is not the kind of talk I'm used to, gi to giving, uh, but um, I, I, hope, um, I hope this will work. Um, so first of all, uh, you, you, are, you are in my music salon, if you want. And I've been playing with uh, synthesizers, analog synthesizers, since I was a teenager. Um, I had a, a cousin who was an aspiring electronic musician, and I was basically hacking the hardware of the synthesizers when I was in high school for him. Um, and the synthesizer he had was uh, EMS um, um, CTA, which uh, basically I have a reproduction of here, right there. So this, this guy here is a modern re-implementation of that uh, classic uh, synthesizer. I'm not gonna use it today. <laughs> um, I have another one here down, which uh, down there here is Arturia Matrix Brute, which I, I, may, I may demonstrate some, a few things with it. Um, and I really like those synthesizers because uh, they have this sort of way of being programmed. They're basically modular synthesizers with sort of a matrix so, so you can connect modules with each other. I have a, a real modular uh, uh, behind me, but I'm not gonna use that today. Um, so I actually got into, uh, the first thing I did with computers when I bought my first single board computer in 1978 is the first thing I did was to try to make music with it. Uh, I sort of hacked a, a D2A converter and, you know, kind of tried to play samples with 1K of RAM and basically, uh, you know, programming directly in uh, uh, assembly was not that easy, but um, um, but I was, I was really motivated by kind of, you know, applying computers to music. I've never actually done a lot of uh, uh, computer music professionally, but uh, tinkering uh, qu quite a bit. Uh, but I consider myself uh, uh, an amateur. Not I. I don't. I don't see this as kind of <laughs> unfortunately a professional activity. Uh, maybe I should at some point. Um, let me let me jump right in. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see this? Can you see my uh, slides? Yes. Okay. Very all right, so the title of my talk is Fulfilling David Wessel's Dream. So uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of uh, David Wessel. Um, David was a professor at UC Berkeley and uh, unfortunately died a few years ago uh, prematurely. He was the founding director of the Center for New Music and Audio Technology. Um, and he had a bit of a jazz background, so he was really interested in improvisation and, and, and sound personalization. And he was really a pioneer of, in the use of neural nets in uh, uh, in music. Uh, he wrote a paper in 1991 uh, entitled Instruments That Learn, Refine Controllers and Source Model Loudspeakers in the Computer Music Journal. Um, and I, I, 
I got interested in that paper because he's, he was citing some of my work. And, uh, and I thought, hmm, that's kind of an interesting, very interesting kind of uh, uh, connection between neural nets and, and, um, and, and, and instruments. And I was already playing kind of uh, electronic wind instruments at the time. Um, so here's, what, here's a quote from his paper. Another bias uh, uh, my jazz background provides is a desire for a very personalized musical performance style, including the phrasing, articulation, and sound itself. The highly personalized sound of a John Coltrane, Miles Davis, or Steve Lacey allows one to identify them with just one note. I'm disappointed that players of computer-based musical instruments have not yet, to my ears at least, developed such compelling personal sound styles. Um, that really sort of, um, you know, talked to me because I'm a, I'm a big jazz fan as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible jazz improviser, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge, um, uh, fan of, uh, of, of, of jazz and jazz performance and improvisation. And I completely relate to what he says. Uh, I can, I can recognize John Coltrane from one note and, um, and, a, and a few other people that, that uh, I've heard a lot. And, and so what, it, what is it that makes sound so personalized? So of course, when you play a wind instrument, particularly a saxophone, but you know, other types of wind instrument as well, uh, the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, your geometry, if you want, and your characteristics shape the sound. Uh, your, the reason, you know, resonant frequencies of your uh, vocal tract and nasal cavity and everything kind of shape the sounds, uh, the, the way the, your lips and the, the tongue kind of presses on the, on the reed and everything. Um, and I've, I've always dreamed of, you know, an instrument that could do this. Um, I have to say right now, uh, spoiler, I don't have a solution to that problem, but, um, but I think it's, it's a, it's an important problem to, uh, to, to address, right? To, and, and the question is how much uh, more expressive an instrument could be if it were able to essentially infer the, for example, the shape of the vocal tract or something like that. Um, and that's basically what uh, David also says in that uh, short article, which is sort of an opinion paper, if you want. I believe that control intimacy is one of the critical missing elements. So much of what I propose is concerned with the tight coupling between gesture and instrumental response. Computer music technology brings something new to the gesture response coupling problem. Acoustic instruments, with few exceptions, work on one gesture, one sound basis. So computer instrumentation allows us to use single gesture to launch an entire pattern of notes. How the gesture influences the course of the pattern in a musically expressive manner is an issue of real concern. Uh, that, that's one of the things he was interested in. That's one of the things I'm interested in, largely because of my limitations in terms of uh, uh, technique. Um, and the, the paper, uh, the work of, of, of mine, of Isabel Guillon, actually, that was a co-author of the Decides, um, is a, a work we did just uh, a couple of years before that, that we, we published also in 1991 on uh, basically handwriting uh, recognition based on the pen trajectory. And so what he envisioned was that if with neural nets, we can process uh, trajectories of anything, uh, that can be captured. Perhaps we could we can use uh, neural nets as a way to sort of control the expressivity of uh, of an instrument, and and perhaps a neural net you know using uh, you know can be adaptive to whatever the the the, the player uh, is is familiar with, or 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 sort of naturally comes to the to the player. It's an interesting concept, but it's not entirely clear it can work because. Um, uh, how, how do you teach someone to play an instrument that itself teaches itself to, to play you, essentially? Um, so that, I don't think this concept has been sort of, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in, in, the, in the audience here have thought about this problem, perhaps even uh, worked on this. Uh, but uh, it's not clear to me like where, you know, how, how, you, would, uh, how you would do this. Um, so the, there's a long history of um, uh, sort of wind instruments. I'm a woodwind player. I'm a, you know, basically, a, you know, I play a recorder and I play, you know, various Renaissance instruments. That's what I was trained on. This is a cronghorn. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of one of those, but they're really, they're really fun. They, um, actually this one is sick apparently, but, um, 
you sometimes have those sounds in the organ. It's a uh, it's a uh, uh, enclosed of a reed under pressure. Um, that one of the keys is stuck, which is why it wasn't sounding too well initially. Um, and you know, oboe and various other instruments. And there's been sort of a, a long history of uh, you know various uh, uh, electronic instruments that have popped up. You know, Akai, um, Yamaha, etc. And, and and some of them are pretty good. I, I kind of like this one actually. Um, and uh, you know, there's this sort of new ones popping up, uh, popping up all the time. Uh, this is sort of a Sofio. I'm kind of a collector of those things. I don't play them very well, but uh, I'm sort of interested in the technology of it. So I have a whole bunch of them. Um, even like really exotic ones that are not really wind instruments like this thing called the uh, Eigen Harp. Um, I'm sure some of you have encountered this. Um, this is actually very unusual. And then things that are designed precisely for uh, sax player. So this is actually an electronic sax from uh, Yamaha, which has exactly the same fingering as a sax and the same sort of keys. But what's, uh, you know, it's basically so they can you can practice silently, but it's it's not um, it's not different from a, a saxophone. So the, the 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 question I have for uh, wind instrument. Um, oh, here's another one that's kind of cute. This is uh, a small a small shop called Berglund uh, in Denmark or Sweden or someplace. And and that that, that one actually is for like uh, it's like a trumpet style. And there's a lot of innovations in this thing, which um, I see I find I find really, uh, really interesting. I'll come back to this in a, in a second. Um, so I've, um, I've been I've been looking for sort of ways to make those uh, instruments uh, compact, simple, but really expressive. Uh, and, and figuring out like, what kind of sensors would be appropriate for that. And I've been working on sort of a, a, a series of uh, of homemade uh, uh, wind instruments. So this is this is one I, I built a few years ago. Um, it's 2D printed. Um, it's using a microcontroller, one of, one of those uh, Teensy microcontrollers. It's got touch sensitive keys, pieces of conduce, conductive paint. Um, it's got a pressure sensor, of course, uh, for uh, breath pressure, as well as uh, lip pressure with um, a resistor, uh, pressure sensitive resistor. And then um, two kind of uh, you know, flat potentiometers here at the bottom uh, for modulation. This actually was not very successful because the problem is that when you lift all your fingers, you don't have any pressure on the on the sensors at the bottom, and you can't you, you can't really play that. So I made a I made a second model, uh, considerably more compact, um, where the basically the top is a printed circuit board that's you know etched with a CNC machine. Same for the bottom, uh, which you know I hope. I hope you can see, um, and the inside is very much kind of, you know, prototype type, you know, kind of hardware. Uh, it's uh, one of those Tinsy microcontrollers, and you know, various uh, various widgets inside. Um, and this this worked okay. It didn't have all the sensors I wanted. One of the sensors I included in this is an IMU, and it's nice to have an IMU because you can use basically motion as uh, as a way to modulate. And then the, the last incarnation of this um, is, is this one. I call this the, the, the Yiwi. But, and so uh, this thing, uh, you, see, you see a picture of it um, here, but I'm, I'm showing you the real thing right here. Uh, it has uh, 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 a new idea, I think, which is the idea of uh, having kind of uh, double keys for each of the fingers. Uh, so as you see, the, the keys, um, I hope you can see my pointer. The keys here are all kind of shaped like a, a bit of a note. And they are, they're split into two halves. And the reason for splitting them into two halves is that uh, you can do sort of, you know, you can slide your finger to, to kind of move up one half, uh, one half step. And so that allows uh, a very wide variety of ways to uh, reach uh, a note. Uh, to go up one half, uh, one half step, or go down one half step. Um, so this is connected to my uh, matrix brute, um, and let's see if I can play this, and you can hear. So uh, this thing has several types of modulation. Uh, at the bottom, so you can see a picture at the bottom here. There is uh, a touch position sensor uh, for the uh, right thumb. Uh, and uh, the the left thumb, of course, controls the um, controls the uh, the octave. Uh, but on the on on the right thumb, uh, you can move the right thumb in two in two directions, and then have two types of modulation. 
uh, let me let me show you um, what that does. So I can I can add a kind of a sub uh, uh, octave down by just moving my uh, uh, my right thumb, uh, left and right. Uh, you can of course. But you can also, uh, with this, those double keys, you can basically go, um, you know, chromatic very easily. I switch octave here, not uh, not wanting to do it. Uh, my octave uh, sensor actually needs a little bit of improvement. Um, there is also two keys here to do to go uh, up and down uh, a half step with either the left pinky or the uh, the right uh, uh, forefinger. Um, this thing has uh, a, a lip pressure sensor, which is actually optical, so it, you can't really see it on the on the slide. And I can't bring it closer because my wire is too is too short. Uh, but this is basically a kind of a plastic transparent tube with a, an optical reflective sensor in it. And it measures the you know how much I pressed basically on the on the thing. So with this, I can do uh, uh, some sort of modulation. You can hear the that's the main modulation, and then the sensor at the top is uh, basically measures the proximity of the top lip, and uh, I've, uh, on this patch it controls vibrato. So you can sort of move back and forth to control vibrato. And uh, so I have pitch bend on this one. And the pitch bend is actually on the pitch angle, which is kind of funny. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to keep it this way because it's not very convenient. I have a couple other parameters because of the IMU that can measure absolute angle. I can change some parameters like reverb and stuff by kind of rotating. Um, and portamento is controlled by the the, the roll angle. So uh, so you know that's another angle of control for the uh, portamento. Um, and uh, so you know a whole bunch of sensors like you know getting familiar with all this. Uh, this is still kind of a, a prototype. There's some kinks in it, but. Um, it um, you know gives a, a bit more expressivity than you find in sort of most uh, uh, most electronic instruments. Um, so this is sort of my uh, <laughs> you know my my musing of uh, electronic instruments. Uh, let's see. Okay, this may be the future of uh, of musical instrument control. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a, if you some of you have seen this video. Um, this is from a, a company called Control Labs that was acquired by Facebook um, uh, a while ago. And uh, Control Lab is uh, not part of Oculus, essentially, within, within Facebook or what's called the Facebook Reality Labs. And what they are working on is a kind of myoelectric sensor. So it's kind of a wrist uh, sensor that you put around uh, your wrist and it's got you know, a whole bunch of uh, myoelectric current detection. And of course, all the muscles uh, of your hand are in your arm. Uh, the tendons can, uh, that control the fingers, but all the muscles are here. So uh, if you have a band uh, you know, around your arm here, uh, you can basically measure the, the force kind of applied to uh, all, the, uh, all the muscles. And in this case here, you can you know, essentially reconstruct the position of the hand uh, just with, uh, with this, uh, this sensor. Um, and so, you know, I would imagine a lot of uh, fun applications of, you know, interaction with uh, sort of musical uh, uh, expression using these kind of sensors. They're not going to be available <laughs> to the public for a while, I'm afraid. But uh, and the main issue with them at the moment is, um, is the fact that they are, they need to be uh, trained for every new user. Uh, and uh, because every, every person is different. And so you need to have kind of basically a training phase 
to uh, for for the system to sort of adapt to the user and to adapt to the particular position of the the sensor. If you remove the sensor and put it back, uh, the they are not exactly in the same position, and you need to kind of have a, a short adaptation phase. So they they're sort of working on so, you know um, uh, getting those kinks out, but um, but my guess is that th this there's going to be uh, this, this is going to open a lot of opportunities for uh, sort of new ways to interact with uh, musical instruments uh, in, in the in the future. Um, this is the, the the signal processing of this is you know heavily based on deep learning and all that stuff. Um, so that that may be kind of a, a good way uh, to the future. Uh, let me uh, switch gear a little bit. So, uh, so much for um, uh, musical instruments. And um, oh, there's one more thing I want to say about musical instruments. Um, one of the things you might see behind me, uh, let me actually stop sharing my screen. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you see behind me here is, uh, is this guy. This is a what's called uh, a Lin instrument. So this is made by a guy called Roger Lin that many of you may have heard of. He's kind of pretty famous in the uh, in, in sort of the electronic music kind of domain. And this is sort of a, a continuous uh, surface. I mean, it has keys, uh, but they are sort of uniform, and you can program it to you know basically kind of activate any key and um, uh, any, anything. So uh, you can make a. You can make a shape with your fingers for a major chord or, or, mi or minor chord. And it's always the same shape, whatever the key. Um, you, know, you, just, you just move your hand and keep your, your fingers in the same relative shape and you, you get the same, the same kind of chord in, in, different, uh, in different keys. I really like this sort of regularity of it, but I'm not a keyboard player. Uh, I'm not a player of this thing either, but I like the, I like the concept. Um, uh, so, it's, it's not clear to me, um, uh, there is this sort of an interesting set of ideas that this guy Berglund came up with. Um, uh, so the, the guy who built this, uh, who sell this uh, uh, kind of trumpet-like uh, iwi, uh, which is based by the way on the same microcontroller that I use for mine. And um, he has a new concept um, where the, the instrument is, is uh, it's still a wind instrument, but you don't hold it the same way as a wind instrument. You basically have your two hands facing each other, uh, and the instrument sits on on your hands, and so that sort of frees the all the fingers. Um, you can use all the fingers and move them in all directions because the instrument basically sits on your hands, uh, and that opens up. Again, a lot of possibilities because you know you can you can move your two thumbs in two direction in two dimensions. You can uh, also kind of move your your all your fingers in, in all dimensions. You could imagine having a sort of uh, multi, you know polyphonic uh, wind instrument with with this kind of configuration. Um, uh, I think my uh, my next uh, homemade wind instrument will probably be something of that type, um, kind of experimenting with new new configurations there. Um, what I like about electronic instruments is that we're not limited by the mechanical constraints that, uh, let's say, a saxophone would be limited by because of the, the sort of, you know, mechanics of the keys and everything. And certainly, um, you know, instruments like this are, you know, extremely hard to 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 play for, so let's say, jazz improvisation because the the fingering is kind of is very complicated. You have to, you don't have, you know. Uh, the key mechanism, so you have to do this with your own fingers, and that means you have to sometimes, you know, move four or five fingers at the same time to uh, switch from one note to, to the next. Uh, so, you know, obviously with uh, electronics, we can we can have any uh, any map we want. What I find really frustrating is that the the commercial uh, instruments do not exploit this um, uh, fully. They um, they basically try to emulate. Uh, more or less uh, uh, classical wind instruments, and uh, as a consequence, you know there is sort of logical uh, fingering for 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 uh, you know flats and sharps that uh, for half tones that don't exist and they should. Um, I don't understand why they're not kind of smarter about this. Um, maybe it's just a force of uh, uh, conservatism, I would say. 
Uh, okay, um, this may be a good time to take a few questions before I switch gear. Uh, if there is any question. Sure. Uh, so, so Jan is dividing the talk into two parts. It seems two to parts. Let's take some questions. Um, yeah. Um, now we got a question popping in. First question is from Santiago. In which ways can we purposely control and customize the response of deep learning driven instruments if these models are mostly black boxes? Well, I mean, they're not really black boxes in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we, we train them to do what we want. That's, the, that's, the, that's why we like them. And so because we can train them to do what we want, uh, that gives us a lot of control. So I don't think the fact that they are a black box is the issue. The fact that they are adaptive is the issue. But that would be true of any uh, any you know learning uh, method, regardless of uh, whether it's deep learning or not. Um, so that you know that that's kind of the a bit of the question I was asking at the beginning, uh, from from kind of reflection on David Wessel's uh, suggestion. Uh, if the if the instrument adapts to you. Uh, will there be kind of a standard way of playing it? Um, can it be taught, for example? Probably not. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, let me uh, switch gear. Uh, Reshare my screen again. Oh, actually. <laughs> okay, another question? Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. Another question from, is from Victor. Do you think the EWI not trying to alter the Bohem system to enable easier note transition is similar to that the Janko keyboard is not being used? Well, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of legacy, I think. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like um, I mean, you have to use a piano keyboard because people are trained to play with piano keyboards and piano keyboards are probably not a very good uh, design. Uh, there are much better designs that you know have been proposed, including for acoustic uh, pianos, um, you know, with those kind of hexagonal kind of shapes and things like this. And and ideas for that go back to the 19th century. The you know implementations are more recent. Um, and the, the instrument is kind of a, an example of this um, in a sort of electronic form. Uh, there's a lot of legacy, and there's a lot of legacy in wind instruments as well. People are used to kind of you know, saxophone-like fingering or, uh, or, or, or things of that type. And, uh, and a lot of wind instruments basically, you know, try to kind of um, hijack that, if you want, or, or, or piggyback on, on, on that. And so it's a little risky to sort of uh, tell people, you know, here is a completely new instrument. Uh, the fingering is completely uh, different. And this is a bit what the Eigenhack tried to do, and they, you know, remains uh, a bit of a niche uh, uh, instrument. I'm, I'm not even sure it's still manufactured. Um, and so, so that's, the, that's the danger. It's the same in, in computer science, right? You, you, can, you can say, well, I have this new programming language, which is much better for what you want to do than, uh, you know, than Python or whatever it is that you're using. Um, but you're going to have a hard time uh, getting people to change. Um, so, so the question is, you know, what's the right trade-off between uh, piggybacking on people's uh, experience and and sort of innovating with sort of new new interaction? I'm more more interested in sort of the new sort of re really being innovative about uh, about interactions. I'm not sure I completely answered the question. Wow, that's thank you. I mean. It... You know, when, when we think about, you know, playing a violin and, and this kind of motion is, is very hard to master and, but people, yes, there's a trade-off between expressivity and, and, you know, the easy to use. For example, if we just compare True. Python versus C, that is, you can do much, you know, quicker um, programming, but you lose the controls of many stuff too. Yeah, um, I mean, there... I mean, sure, uh, there is clearly a trade-off even for acoustic instruments, right? So for example, the recorder um, that I was showing you earlier, this is not a very expressive instrument. You cannot modulate uh, the volume that much because, uh, because it changes the pitch. And so you can't, you can't really, the, the only express, expression you have is in the tonguing, really. 
yeah. and, you know, and a bit in the a bit in the finger transitions, but mostly just the tonguing. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not a very uh, expressive instrument. It's beautiful sound, not very expressive, uh, um, but it's easy to make a sound with it, right? So mm -hmm. contrary to the violin, where you know it's it's kind of hard to get a good sound out of it and on pitch. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, it gives you more expressivity, right? So that it's a, there's a similar thing in uh, uh, aerospace where you know you have a, an airplane and uh, you can have the airplane. You have a, a trade-off between the airplane being stable and maneuverable. Yes, uh, an airplane that is very maneuverable is more unstable than, yeah. than one uh, that is not. So <laughs> it's the same. It's the same trade-off physically. Um, okay, so let me switch gear a bit and, and talk about uh, new developments uh, in, uh, in deep learning that may be relevant to uh, musical applications, although I'm not going to talk about music applications. Um, and, and so not exactly knowing what the background of the audience is, uh, I have a few sort of introductory uh, slides about machine learning, but Gus is telling me that you're all, you're all experts, you all know about machine learning and stuff, so I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to skip this. Um, but I'm just going to say most applications of machine learning, as you probably know, are uh, the result of uh, a paradigm called supervised learning, where you basically show examples of inputs to the machine together with corresponding desired outputs. And the machine adapts uh, or adjusts its own parameters so that uh, it maps the input to the, the desired output. Uh, and you can use this for classification, for regression, and it's you know, astonishingly successful for things like speech recognition and text classification, translation. Uh, and all kinds of applications of computer vision, of course. And, and this you know, all works by uh, minimizing some sort of objective function uh, using a gradient-based algorithm. Uh, and deep learning is nothing more than the idea of kind of stacking multiple nonlinear modules on top of each other so that the, the function you, the, the system can, uh, can learn uh, is, can be, is very flexible, essentially. Um, there are theorems that shows, show that uh, with only two layers, in fact, uh, a single layer nonlinearity inside the system, you can approach any function as close as you want, um, although not necessarily efficiently. Um, and what has uh, happened over the last few years is basically people have come up with sort of new types of architectures that, and, you know, that have sort of increasingly large number of layers that are appropriate for particular applications. Um, so, but, but most of them are based on essentially a, a relatively small number of, uh, you know, basic uh, computing elements, if you want. One is just linear combinations, essentially. Um, and so that comes down to, you know, viewing the activations of one layer as a vector. You multiply it by matrix, you get a new vector. And that vector basically is formed uh, by uh, uh, weighted sums of the different weights uh, that correspond to the, the rows of the, of the matrix of the values in the input vector. And then you, uh, the next step would be a nonlinear uh, uh, transform, uh, generally a pointwise nonlinear transform inside the network. Uh, and then you repeat the process, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. That would be sort of a classical neural net. Um, there's a few types of uh, you know, basic uh, sort of canonical circuits that people have added since then. Things that uh, sometimes are called attention and things like this. Basically what they come down to is multiplicative interactions between uh, activations between state variables um, that you know get multiplied with each other instead of being just added with weights, uh, and that turns out to be really powerful for all kinds of uh, all kinds of applications. And of course, the, the the big advantage of this is that you can use gradient-based algorithms to to train those systems. Uh, you can compute gradients with back propagation, uh, and in fact, the tools that are available for for us now, the the PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, etc., of the world, allow us to essentially write a program in Python or whatever your favorite language is, and then automatically get um, a separate program that you don't even see that can compute the gradient of whatever objective function with respect to the parameters of your, uh, of your network. Um, you know, specialized architectures can be used for things like uh, uh, image recognition, such as convolutional nets, which you may have heard of. Uh, but, okay, that's the state of the art, we can do, Fantastic things with those with with those uh, those neural nets. Uh, we keep making them bigger, and they keep working better. But there are three challenges today that AI and machine learning are, are, are facing. Uh, the the first one is 
can we learn with your label data? Like, you know, is, is there a way for machines to learn a little bit more like humans and animals without uh, requiring a lot of label data? Essentially, learn to represent the world by observation, let's say. Uh, the second one is learning to reason and in a way that is compatible with machine learning. We don't really know how to do this at the moment. Um, and the third one, I'm not even going to talk about it because nobody has any idea how to do that. Um, so one question we can ask ourselves is um, how, how do humans and animals learn um, and how do they learn so quickly? And they probably don't use either re, uh, re, supervised learning or even reinforcement learning. When you look at, um, this is a chart put together by Emmanuel Dupou, who's uh, a uh, colleague at Facebook in Paris and also at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. Um, and he put this chart that shows at what age babies learn basic concepts, like the, the fact that there are, you know, animate and inanimate objects, the fact that some objects, you know, you set them on a table and they, they stay there, others fall. The fact that uh, there is gravity, an object that is not supported is going to fall, things like this. So babies learn about gravity, for example, around the age of eight or nine months. Uh, and before that, you know, they're not surprised if they see an object appearing to float in the air. They've not so sort of integrated the fact that objects are supposed to fall. And so how do we learn this? Uh, how, how is it that, you know, by observing the world, we, we figure that uh, objects are supposed to fall. We learn intuitive physics uh, by, by observation mostly. Very little interaction with the world or action, intervention, if you want, uh, in, in the first few months of life. And that's the type of learning that uh, I would be interested in reproducing in machines. Um, and the reason I'd like to be able to reproduce this in machine is not just for practical purpose. It's not just because I want to reduce the amount of uh, label data that is required to you know, train an image classifier or something like that, but, uh, but also because I think the, the, the way to get machines to acquire some sort of common sense is to allow them to learn by you know, essentially just watching videos or, uh, you know, learning how the world works by observation. So that's where, um, and, 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 you know, my friend Jitendra Malik, who's a professor at Berkeley, but also uh, at Facebook, uh, kind of dug up this uh, reference um, that says that common sense is a collection of models. So we have models of the world in our head that allow us to apprehend uh, a new situation we're facing. And common sense really is the connection of all of those, all of those models. We can uh, configure our frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex to, uh, you know, deal with the situation at hand. Uh, and, and that's because we've been trained to predict uh, what the world is, gonna, is going to do, uh, is either as a consequence of our actions or just because the world is being the world. So how do we get machines to run this? Uh, that's the concept of self-supervised learning. So that's become kind of really successful in some domains uh, in recent years, particularly in natural language processing, uh, but now increasingly in image recognition and speech. And the idea of self-supervised learning is learning to fill in the blank. So you 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 train it. You you have a piece of data. Let's say a, a video clip. Uh, you show a machine a piece of it, and you ask the machine to predict the missing piece. Okay. So it could be predicting the future. It could be predicting the past. It could be predicting missing frames, it could be predicting the left from the from the right, you know, things like that, right? Filling in the blanks. That's really what, what self-supervised learning is about. So show a segment of a video clip, hide the continuation of it, and then reveal the rest of the video clip, and then the machine trains itself to kind of make that prediction. And the main issue with this is that um, you have to deal with uncertainty. There are many, many ways a particular video clip can uh, be uh, continued. Uh, you're watching me giving a talk right now. Uh, the next thing I could do is a gesture with my hand, or I could you know, move my head in one direction or another. And if you have to make a single prediction uh, for what I'm going to look like, what, what the frame you're going to look like is going to be in five seconds. Uh, and you have to make that prediction by, I don't know, minimizing the squared error. Uh, um, you, you're going to have to predict a blurry image of, of me, in, which would be the average of all the possible things I could do. And that's not a good prediction. So the question is, you know, how do we represent uh, not a single prediction? How, how do we build a machine to learn not just a single prediction, but a whole set of predictions, or even a distribution of predictions? Now, predicting a distribution over frames of a video is 
basically impossible. It's basically intractable. We don't know how to represent distributions in high-dimensional continuous spaces, at least not useful ones. So maybe we have to abandon this whole idea of, uh, of uh, learning of probabilistic models, essentially. But that's a bit of a technical issue. Uh, so what could self-supervised learning be used for? It could be used for two things. It can be used to learn representations of the world, and I'll show some examples, or it can be used to learn predictive models of the world. So uh, models that would um, allow an agent to predict in advance what's going to happen in the world, maybe a, as a consequence of its actions, and uh, may allow a system to, um, to, to, to plan, plan ahead. Uh, because it has this, this model of uh, how the world is going to evolve. Um, this is similar to what people do in optimal control and, and things like that. Um, so let me uh, uh, talk about uh, an approach that has been very, very successful in the context of uh, image recognition over the last year or so. It's very recent. Um, but before I do this, um, I'm there's been a lot of incredible success of self-supervised learning in the context of natural language processing. So the way you do self-supervised learning in the context of natural language processing, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this, is you take a, a long piece of text, uh, multiple sentences, something like 500 words or something like that, and you, you remove some of the words, typically 10%, 15% of the words. You, you replace them by kind of a blank marker, if you want. And you train a giant neural net, uh, some of them are truly giant, to predict the words that are missing. In the process of doing so, the system has to build a good representation of text. Uh, because if you train it with sentences of the type, for example, the blank chases the blank in the kitchen, it might be a cat chasing a mouse, or the blank chases the blank in the savanna, it might be a lion chasing an antelope or something. Um, so the system has to basically learn to represent words in such a way that it can make those predictions. And that depends on context. And so um, that basically causes uh, systems to, to build good representations of the world uh, or, or text, as a matter of fact, um, to a surprising degree. Um, so this way of pre-training a system using self-supervised learning, filling in the blanks, um, is the basis of all the sort of large scale uh, NLP systems today that do translation or text classification or whatever. They, they, they're all pre-trained using uh, a technique of this type. So immediately people have thought, why don't we apply this to uh, images? Take an image, blank some, some parts of it, just you know, replace them with sort of a gray patch and then train some big neural net, big convolutional net of some kind to fill in the blanks. And the representations of images that you get out of this in the middle of this network are not very good. If you use them as input to a classifier for classifying images, they don't work very well. Um, it's been very disappointing. The difference between natural language, uh, between language and image is that language is discrete. And so the predictions you're asking the system to make are discrete predictions. You can have a, a giant vector that represents the probability with which uh, every single word in your dictionary may appear at one location. So it's easy to represent uncertainty in discrete spaces. Whereas with uh, the image version where you're blanking out parts of the image, the number of poss you know, potential possibilities of uh, how to fill in the, the, the blank area or the missing frames in a video is such that we don't know how to represent the, the, we don't have a softmax over all possible images. And so um, that's probably why those uh, approaches have not been very successful. Now, in the context of music, you can view music either as discrete or not. Uh, music notation is kind of discrete. You have, you have discrete notes. They have a, a given length, uh, et cetera. So at that level, it's discrete. But if you kind of want to include all of the things that we, we, we put in music, uh, all the expression and everything, it's not discrete anymore. And so it's not entirely clear that the methods that can be applied for, that have been applied to NLP, would translate in the context of music if you want to deal with uh, all the complexity of music, not just the score, essentially. Um, but here is what I'm excited about today, okay? And pretty much all the time, I, all my research is kind of spent working on this. 
is uh, a new type of self-supervised learning using an architecture called uh, joint embedding. We used to call them Siamese neural nets, okay? Uh, but we don't call them that, that way anymore because the approach is a little more general. So one, um, so forget about the, the one on the, on the left. This is kind of an approach to self-supervised learning that so far hasn't been very successful. The one on the right is the one that I'm really interested in. So you show two, um, um, let's say two images. And if those two images are basically different views of the same thing, or one is a kind of distorted version of the other so that the content uh, of those two images is essentially the same, uh, even though the details may be different. You, you train two neural nets, or maybe the same neural net, to produce uh, vectors called embeddings. And you train those vectors to be essentially identical, to be the same vector, when x and y are this, the same content. It could be different images, but with the same content. Okay, So take an image, distort it a little bit, change the scale, shift it, uh, modify the colors. Uh, so that's your y. Now propagate the x and y through your two branches in your neural net and train the system to produce the same output. Okay, That's called joint embedding. Um, and uh, the, the main issue with, with uh, training a system like this is that uh, it's easy to train it to produce the same output for um, uh, inputs that are modified version of each other. But what you also have to make sure of is that you have to make sure that for things that are actually different, the two networks produce very different vectors. Okay, And that's the complicated part. Uh, the way to approach this in the sort of theoretical context is through something called energy-based models, which I'm not going to go into because uh, it would take too long and it's a little technical. But basically, you could think of the distance between the two vectors that come out as uh, representing some sort of energy function in the space of uh, x and y. And what you want is you want low energy for pairs of x and y's that are compatible and high energy for pairs of x and y's that are not compatible. And the question is, how do you make sure that the energy for things that are not compatible is higher than for things that are compatible? Um, so there is a set of methods that are called uh, contrastive methods. And they consist in uh, essentially, I think I have something like that, yeah. Um, they consist of um, taking a pair of images that are of the same content and then training the networks to produce similar outputs. And then having contrastive samples that are images that are different, you know they're different. So you take a, a chessboard and a, I don't know, a, a, a polar bear or something, and you propagate those two through the networks, and you train the networks to uh, produce different outputs. So basically, you push the two vectors away from each other. Uh, those work pretty well if you train a neural net to produce to using this process. This neural net will produce representations of images that, when you feed them to a classifier, will actually produce pretty good results. Um, and in fact, there is a whole bunch of uh, different different methods to do contrastive joint embedding these days. Uh, they've pop they've all popped up over the last, I mean, except for the original ones from the early 90s and mid 2000, uh, they've all popped up in the last two years or so. Um, some of them came from Facebook, some of them came from DeepMind, some of them from Google, some of them from uh, universities, some of them from Obo actually came from uh, a company in France. Um, so they, they, they're all slightly different, but they're all based on the same idea that you have those uh, pairs that are compatible and you train the energy, which means the different the distance between the two outputs to be small. And then you have contrastive pairs and you push the two outputs away from each other. Uh, Suave is a little different. This is from a, a team at Facebook Air Research in Paris, some of my colleagues. And that uses basically a quantization, a vector quantization uh, coming out of one of the networks. And it uses the sort of vector quantized uh, uh, sort of responsibility vectors as kind of a target for the other network. I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's a form of distillation. You can think of it this way. So those work quite well. Swerve in particular is, uh, really works really well. Um, but they're a little slow because you need to have many of those contrastive samples to, to train the system. Um, and it's an old idea that goes back to a paper of mine from the early 90s, and they were kind of 
somewhat similar papers from Jeff Hinton's group in the early, around the same time in the 90s as well. Um, so that, that's the main idea. Pairs of similar outputs train the distance to be small, pairs of dissimilar outputs and train the uh, distance to be large using various loss functions. Um, but here is the trick. What's, ha what's happened over the last uh, year or so is that there's a bunch of methods that have appeared that don't require this contrastive phase. And this is super exciting. So one, one of the first one was something called BYOL that came out of DeepMind. And it's not entirely clear why it works. And I'm going to go into the details of, uh, of what it does. Um, and then there are three methods here, two of which uh, Barlow Twins and Vicreg came out of uh, the group I, I lead at uh, Facebook. And uh, WMSE came from uh, uh, another group. Um, and they're based on the same uh, concept, which is to basically maintain the information content uh, of the representations coming out of the two networks in some ways. Uh, and at the same time, try to make the two, uh, the two outputs similar. right? So you only show pairs of similar images. You, do, you don't have to use contrastive samples, pairs of dissimilar images. Um, you only show pairs of similar images. You train the system to produce essentially identical vectors for the, the, two, the two images. But simultaneously with this, you, you have a, a regularizer that uh, basically maximizes or, or maintains, uh, sustains the information content uh, uh, of the representations to prevent uh, a collapse, to basically prevent the representation from ignoring the inputs and just be constant, okay? Um, so I'm going to describe VicReg because uh, this is the one that I think is the, 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 the simplest to, to understand and also the one that, that um, I mean, they, they all work kind of similarly, but uh, sort of is easier to, uh, to explain and, and probably kind of more general. So VicReg, um, uh, let's see, here's VicReg. Um, so, uh, take an image, distort it into different ways, propagate those two images through uh, two branches of the network. The two networks don't have to be identical. Uh, in most other methods, the two networks have to be identical. They have to share weights. Here, they don't. They can be completely different. Um, and then you get a representation that's called Y uh, and Y prime for the other image. Then you run this through a neural net with a few layers that actually expands the dimension of that representation. So typically, the representation for a typical image the dimension of Y would be about 2,000. And the dimension of Z would be typically 4,000 or 8,000, something like that. And then the, there's three criteria for training the system. One criterion says Z and Z prime should be as close to each other as possible um, because the two images have the same content, essentially. The other criterion says the variance over a batch, or over time, of each component of both Z and Z prime should be above a certain threshold. So it's basically a hinge loss that says, I want the variance of each variable of the, of the, the embedding Z to be at least some constant. That's kind of arbitrary that you fix, okay? So that prevents the, the, uh, the variables from collapsing, just be constant and equal to zero or, or just a constant value. They have to vary, right? You force them to vary. So that kind of maintains the information content. But you need to do something else because the system could cheat by basically making all the variables the same. So there is another criterion that tries to decorrelate all the variables in each of the vectors. Okay, so you compute the covariance matrix basically of, uh, of the vectors over a batch. And you say, I want this covariance matrix to be as close to uh, the off diagonal terms of that covariance matrix to be as close to zero as possible. And what that means is that I want all the variables of a vector, either z or z prime, to be decorrelated with each other uh, over a batch. Uh, and that works really well. So you, you take a network, ResNet 50 or something, you, you pre-train it using this VicReg uh, criterion, and then you use the representation, you, you fix the network, you use the representation as input to a classifier. You train this classifier, linear classifier on ImageNet, let's say. And, uh, and you see the result and you know this works just as well as pretty much all the other methods, except perhaps SWAG, which uses an additional trick called multi-core. Um, 
it also uh, can produce uh, pretty decent results if the supervised uh, phase is, uh, you know, only uses a, a tiny portion of the of, of the labeled uh, samples. And you can use the same representation for transfer learning. So you can now, you know, use the representation as input to another classifier that does something else, like uh, uh, place classification or object detection or things like that. Um, and this is somewhat uh, technical, but VicRag doesn't require any normalization or anything like that. Uh, and what's more interesting is that it doesn't require uh, the, the two branches to be, uh, to be shared. Uh, the two branches can be different. This opens the door to a lot of different applications, particularly in music. So for example, uh, you could train a system, you could have a uh, VicRag style uh, learning where one network would see an initial segment of a piece of music, and then the other one would see the, the, the following segment. And then the system would try to learn a representation that uh, you know, would allow the, the following segment to be predictable from the initial segment, or perhaps predict a, a missing uh, bar uh, from the surrounding uh, bars or something like that. Uh, and you can imagine systems to you know, be able to learn sort of hierarchical representations of uh, of uh, musical data, perhaps uh, automatically extract uh, good features from directly from audio. So the people who have been using uh, at Facebook, among other things, have been using self-supervised learning of the contrastive uh, kind, not the non-contrastive so far yet, for learning uh, uh, features directly from waveform for speech recognition. And this works really well. So essentially, you, um, you feed a, a what amounts to a conventional net uh, TDNN essentially with raw um, uh, audio, and and you train using some contrastive method. You train the system to um, you know basically predict the next segment of audio, uh, or to tell you which next seg you know which of uh, a collection of potential next segment is the correct one, uh, which is a form of contrastive uh, self-supervised learning, uh, and that learns pretty good features. There's another method that is similar to Suave, where you can quantize the, the, uh, the vectors that come out of the neural net, and then you use them as targets for uh, kind of training a, a similar network. And those basically spontaneously come up with um, things like phones and you know, kind of acoustic categories, which is kind of amazing. Uh, you can use those representations then to train a speech recognizer, and you can get really close to state of the art with just 10 minutes of, uh, of uh, labeled data. Uh, so I'm really excited about those methods. They're very, very new. This uh, VicRag paper uh, popped up on archive just uh, last month uh, from my group. It's, uh, it's been submitted to a conference. And um, um, I think it's one of the things I'm the most excited about in the last 10 years in machine learning. So that tells you something. I may be wrong about this, but I have a lot of hope that this will basically open the door to uh, a lot of new uh, possibilities and applications of deep learning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Um, you know, in the first part, you talk about fulfilling the with whistle stream, and uh, it's kind of at a second part, you are pointing out the direction and the, the, the possible the deep learning technology that can be, you know, used on music on both symbolic domain or uh, continuous wave domain, spectrum domain, yeah. Yeah, the second um, part is more about my dreams than, uh, <laughs> than David Wessels, yes. <laughs> and so everyone now uh, feel free to uh, raise questions using the Q&A feature. Um, yeah, and, uh, we, we actually got the one question left over from the first part if I'm allowed to pick this up. This um, question is from Michael. I found it interesting that the, the impressive instruments that you've designed and built so far do not seem to be adaptive. Could you reflect on that, please? Yeah, this is, um, you know, I'm trying to get the basics first uh, before I kind of jump into kind of making them adaptive. So I've been actually thinking about this uh, already the, the microcontrollers that are available now, those, so I'm using uh, something called, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, called the Teensy, Teensy 4. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this microcontroller. 
It's, it's made by a guy called uh, Paul uh, Stoffrigan, I think it was Stoffrigan um, in, uh, in the US, um, you know, basically by himself. But you can find those, uh, you know, they're sort of fairly easy to get. Uh, and they, they're extremely powerful. There's, uh, you know, a fairly powerful uh, processor on them um, that, you know, could run neural nets in principle, not very big ones, but, um, but I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, thinking of kind of using this type of, uh, of, of microcontroller uh, for sort of, you know, adaptivity. Uh, I mean, another possibility, of course, is to just, you know, feed the sensor output directly to a computer and then do everything on the, on the laptop. But I like the idea of having kind of a self-contained uh, self system. Um, so the big question is like, what would be the, the right thing to, to make adaptive? Uh, would it be, so, okay, here is, I have a terrible confession to make, which is that, you know, I, I'd love to be able to, uh, to do like, you know, hard bop improvisation, but like, you know, I'm, my, my technique is terrible and I'm 60, so I'm not gonna get much better even if I practice like, like crazy. Um, and so one question is, you know, would there be a technology that would, uh, you know, essentially allow me to, uh, you know, play what I think without having to kind of move my fingers accordingly, you know, <laughs> that's, that's basically the, the main question. Uh, and, you know, also without having to sort of, you know, implant electrodes in my brain, right? Uh, and so, you know, how do we interpret, uh, you know, muscle movement or, or myoelectric currents or, or whatever, uh, so as to produce uh, sort of, you know, high level musical concepts? Uh, in ways that are predictable. It has to be predictable, that's the main issue. Um, if you make something adaptive, it becomes non-predictable. So how do you make it predictable? Great, uh, thank maybe, you. Maybe, maybe, maybe I have a partial answer to that, my own question, okay? Which is, uh, you, know, you, you know, you can play in or whistle or sing or whatever, uh, together with, you know, your favorite, uh, uh, you know, jazz improviser. Uh, and, you know, even if you can't uh, improvise on, you know, John Coltrane's giant step to save your life, you can, you can sort of you know, try to whistle with it. Uh, and perhaps you can train a system to basically, you know, interpolate from your, your sort of uh, weak indication of what you're doing, something like that, maybe. Thank you. Uh, next question is, thank you very much for sharing this. Do you have recommended books on artificial intelligence for starters? We have a lot of students. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. And unfortunately, I don't. Um, OK, if you read French, I have a book. It's called Quand la machine apprend. Uh, I'm working on the English translation, but it's not going to come out until probably next year. Um, but um, it's, um, it's for a wide audience. Um, it's got a little bit of history. It's got, um, you know, explanations for the sort of basic principles behind neural nets and backprop, et cetera. And then uh, the latter part is more about like the future and what you can do currently with AI. So this is more for a general audience sort of, you know, sort of you need a sort of high school level education if you want, um, something like that. Um, if you want something a little more technical, the, there is essentially only one uh, book, which is the, the Goodfellow, uh, Benjo, and Corville uh, textbook, which I think, you know, it's sad to say, but it's starting to get a little dated uh, and perhaps uh, a little overly complicated for a lot of uh, uh, people who approach this. However, what I would suggest is that there is a lot of online courses on deep learning that are probably better than a book because, you know, you can get through it by just watching videos. Uh, one of my courses is online, the, the sort of 20, the spring 2020 edition of my deep learning course uh, is online um, with, uh, you know, PyTorch code and all that stuff. So you can, um, you, you can use that. It's not as good as a textbook, but it's, you know, gets you there. All right, thanks. Oh. Look forward to your new book and you know, translating in English. <laughs> uh, 
next question is from Charles. Uh, great to hear that you mentioned Control Lab and Mail Electronic Interface. We have had a history of time working work using these techniques, indeed, particularly with the old Dynamic Labs mail controller. You know, it's disappointing that hardware availability seems to have dried up for now. Uh, so could you reflect on the role that big tech might have in helping or hindering the access to these kind of new interface technologies by artists who seek to explore, express, and extend themselves with it? Yeah, I mean, certainly not hindering, I hope. <laughs> uh, I mean, what good news about uh, a lot of stuff that is on the Facebook is that uh, you know, most of it is uh, open. Um, and certainly the, you know, all the research is, is published. Uh, most of the code is open source. I mean, certainly everything that comes out of FAIR is uh, published in open source. Now, um, uh, Facebook Reality Labs operates slightly differently because it's basically a, a consumer product division, right? They, 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 they make physical things. Uh, and the modus operandi for consumer product companies is generally a little more secretive, a little less open than other ones. Um, but I, I have good hopes that, uh, you know, some of what Control Labs is, is producing will, will come with you know, APIs and stuff. So you can kind of build your own, uh, your own things with it. Um, that's basically what happened with Oculus. Uh, the first version of Oculus, the Oculus Rift, you know, came with an API and you, know, you could hack it and you could do whatever you want, wanted with it. Then it became kind of a, you know, mass market consumer product. So it's kind of a different thing. You, you build games for it and, you know, it's much more polished. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, uh, I think, uh, um, I think there would be possibilities there um, as well. Um, I can't tell you how long it's going to take. I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, next question um, from Junyan. Thank you, Jan, for the great talk. Uh, as another potential aspect of future deep learning, as you point out, um, what is your opinion on the combination of logical reasoning which is mostly in the in the um, mental set of symbolism and deep learning. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, one of the problems I, I cited as uh, the you know one of the main uh, obstacles uh, of uh, you know towards you know more intelligent machines is uh, the ability, I mean, giving the ability for, to machines to uh, to reason. Um, and of course, you know, the classical AI, you know, good old fashioned AI from the 70s and 80s um, really focused on this idea of reasoning, logical reasoning in particular, uh, but, you know, other forms of reasoning and search and things like that. The problem with reasoning of, of that form, logical reasoning, is that it's basically incompatible with sort of gradient based learning, if you want, because it's, uh, you know, intimately non differentiable in manipulated symbols. Uh, that's kind of essentially a compositional nature, right? It's discrete. So the big question is, how do we make reasoning compatible with kind of smooth gradient-based stuff, right? Like, like deep learning. And, you know, one philosophy that Jeff Hinton has been promoting for decades is the idea that we should not manipulate symbols. We should manipulate uh, representations of objects, which are the same as symbols. Uh, but they should be represented by basically a vector of properties, okay? So a symbol is just a tag, it's a name that you use to index a bunch of properties, right? Um, what Jeff Hinton is saying is that, you know, represent the symbol as a vector where each component represents the, you know, a, a property, the value of a property or something like this. So what that means is now you can, if you have two vectors that represent two objects, you can do operations on those vectors. Uh, you can compare them. You can compute the distance. You can subtract them. You can, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff with vectors. Um, and basically, what you you turn reasoning into a sequence of, uh, you know, algebraic operations or or mathematical uh, functions that you can insist on being smooth and differentiable. And so that would be a way of making uh, reasoning compatible with uh, 
uh, with deep learning. There is a paper on this actually, which was sort of a vision paper. Uh, I mean, not computer vision, but sort of a vision for the future by my friend Leon Botou a few years ago, uh, called From Machine Learning to Machine Reasoning, where he was kind of promoting this idea a little bit. Um, and this was a bit of a, a blueprint for some work that uh, quite a few people at uh, Facebook, among others, but uh, DeepMind and other places, uh, you know, University of Washington and the Allen AI Institute have been trying to do of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, getting machines to reason. I, I have a, a slightly different idea about reasoning. I think uh, most forms of reasoning can be seen as um, basically minimizing some function. Um, for example, planning, okay? So planning a sequence of action, of actions can be done by, by reasoning, but you can view it, uh, you know, in, in the context of optimal control, for example, planning is actually uh, uh, a, a form of optimization of an objective function. You have an objective which measures, you know, how distant your robot arm is from the object it's supposed to grab. Uh, and you're basically computing a sequence of action that will minimize that distance, essentially, and some other criteria, maybe uh, the time it takes to get there and energy spent and things like that. And so I think a lot of reasoning can be reduced to energy minimization, essentially. Thank you. Oh, that's very interesting. So, so, so my understanding is that from your description is eventually that uh, symbolism could emerge from connectionism. That's yeah. okay. So, and, and uh, according to Douglas uh, word in his book, GEV, which is, you know, 20 years, 30 years even, is it, we have trunked representation and eventually there are some operation on this trunked operation that maybe underneath is gradient based, but high level is it looks like, it looks like logic operation. Yeah, I mean, there's a big question about like, you know, what causes the emergence of symbols, right? What causes the emergence of discrete categories from yes. sort of continuous representation, continuous embeddings, right? The self-supervised the self learning methods I've, I've described uh, basically all try to construct embeddings which are essentially continuous representations of inputs, right? There's no symbols there, except the methods that are based on quantization. So things like SWAR, for example, explicitly quantize the the embedding space into kind of discrete symbols. If you, I mean, they're yeah. not symbols; they're prototypes. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, some of the self-supervised learning methods for speech also kind of work on that uh, on that on that assumption. So you know, maybe there's sort of a smooth way of uh, kind of moving from continuous representations to kind of discrete representations, and symbols are just the name that we give to those prototypes. Thanks. Uh, next question. Uh, is from Shuchi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. One big challenge in music generation is the limitation of data, especially for symbolic music generation. It is so hard to find clean computer readable symbolic music. And this is not comparable to the scale of image and language data. Also different from music genre, different music genre have different styles. Pre-training will normalize their, these characteristics this made deep learning actually harder for music generation. Do you have an idea on how do we solve this data, data limitation and increase the data efficiency, this kind of problem? Thank yeah, you. I mean, they're just vague ideas, but um, there's two answers to this. So the first one is, um, is that, you know, perhaps with those kind of new self-supervised learning methods, uh, we can, we can get machines to learn representations of music directly from audio. So that would greatly increase the, the, the amount of data that we have. I mean, right now, you know, we have to work from either, you know, MIDI uh, uh, transcriptions, I mean, performance that have been captured, you know, from MIDI or some other format uh, or, or manual transcriptions. And so that can eliminate the volume. This is very similar to the limitations of supervised learning, right? Where you have to basically label every image, blah, blah, blah. So if you can extract representations from raw data without having to go to a manual uh, labeling phase, um, then you could use that representation uh, as you know, the essential representation for music generation or whatever. Um, so, I mean, we seem to be able to do this, right? Um, we, you know, as humans, you know, we hear music, 
of whatever culture we happen to have you know, grown uh, uh, into. Uh, and, and we spontaneously develop the, the concepts of uh, you know, what sounds to us as you know, good melodies or harmonious and, and scales and things like this, right? So our vocabulary, our kind of musical vocabulary is learned spontaneously from raw audio. Yes. So it is possible. Okay, to learn what music is just from raw audio. And I think some of those self-supervised learning techniques could actually get, get us there. You know, uh, it's already, it already works for speech. I don't see why it wouldn't work for music, um, learning representation of music directly from audio. So that's the first thing. Um, and, uh, and, and another approach to this would be, uh, if deep learning system made sufficient progress so that we get uh, polyphonic transcription, reliable polyphonic transcription. Uh, this is a bit of a holy grail of, uh, you know, music information retrieval, right? Yeah. We have, yes. uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, reliable polyphonic transcription uh, systems, automatic yeah. transcription systems. And we don't, I mean, we have them for piano, but not for anything else, basically. Yes. Yeah, uh, just if I'm allowed to extrapolate that question a little bit, you know, one direction is, is you know, it would be fantastic if a machine learning model with the proper inductive bias could, you know, automatically get the concept of node pitch just yeah. from the raw audio, and that would be fantastic. And that's kind of analogous to, you know, just from the speech, and they kind of have this representation of word. And uh, that's, that's still a little far away, huh? seems to be. Yeah, the, the question is whether you can do this from raw audio or whether you have to kind of hardwire things that are similar to what you see in the cochlea where, you know, um, you know basically you get, uh, you know, roughly what corresponds to a constant Q transform or something like this, which, you know, gives you some idea of, uh, you know, where basically a pitch uh, shift corresponds to kind of a, a shift of activations, uh, which is what I like in the constant Q transform. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so many machine learning related questions. So next question is a little bit light from Xudong. Cool, uh, I want to ask a question about the studio environment. The device is so cool. Uh, I guess the question is where did you get this and, uh, and how, how do you, you know, cope with this music pro, pro, pro lab uh, in your you know, immersive deep learning research life? <laughs> well, the thing is, I don't have enough time to actually play with all those toys. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of an overkill for me, you know, it's, uh, uh, I've, I've built, um, this is a relatively new house in New Jersey, we've been sort of, you know, in, in this, normally we spend most of our time in New York, but we also have a house in New Jersey and I have enough space here that I can set, set this up. And because of COVID, you know, we've been sort of isolated here. So I've been working on those projects, those, those sort of uh, EWI instruments and kind of setting up this, uh, this whole music studio. But it's only in recent, recent time, really. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm still kind of very much kind of experimenting with all the, the synthesizers I have here. I have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm playing a little bit with, um, you know, sort of handmade, you know, homemade uh, modules for my uh, modular synthesizer in the back. Um, which are sort of hybrid uh, digital analog. So things that um, also use microcontrollers basically, but you know, can be inserted into a modular, modular synth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with uh, sound generation because um, I, I like to, I'd like those EWIs to basically have uh, sound synthesis uh, capabilities that you know, give, give more control, more direct control. So that the interfaces like, you know, MIDI is really a, uh, very limiting. In many ways, um, so I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, basically having a, you know, building a, a, a digital th synth as a, as a module or a module synthesizer that would, you know, have a dedicated link to an EWI um, that would just, you know, spit out raw sensor outputs, then the, the system will, you know, basically digest that directly. So I wouldn't be bound by MIDI uh, limitations essentially. You know, MIDI is really designed for keyboards, not not so much for wind instruments. There are there are widgets, so I have I have one here. Uh, I can't remember if I played it earlier, 
this is this is really a wonderful a wonderful widget. It's um, something called an Espresso, and it's it's a it's a wind synthesizer essentially. It's designed for uh, re, uh, e wii players. Uh, it's basically a little a little Linux computer inside, ARM based Linux computer. Uh, no, actually, I think it's Intel based or so whatever. Um, and you know you can plug any UI on it, and it's uh, it's made by this guy in Germany, and you know he really does a, a fantastic job actually at this. And the, the sounds are really cool. This is supposed to be a trumpet sound. Um, <laughs> it is a good trumpet sound actually, but yeah, uh, yeah, you have uh, you know like. Miles Davis style trumpet sound. Things like that. <laughs> so you have like all kinds of sounds. It's, it's, it's really cool. And it's, it's designed to kind of react to things like vibrato, you know, from the, it doesn't need a lot of sensors. It basically interprets your, your breath uh, pressure variation. Uh, you can do growls and, and things. So it's, uh, it's pretty sophisticated. Okay. I, I hope you, you know, during this pandemic, at least enjoy yourself by overfeeding yeah, I, yourself in, in this music environment. <laughs> right, you know, I, I, I was careful not to play anything complicated because, you know, you will realize I'm really bad. <laughs> Next question is from Juan Zhang. Thanks for your talk. What's your thought about the potential of learning joint embedding space for music? Would it be more difficult to direct uh, the networks to learn specific categories or types, given the subjective nature of music. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, music is really sort of, as I said, you know, there is a, a discrete component, which which is the only one that we can represent in notation. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of it is is not captured by notation, and it's essentially non non-discrete, right, in nature. Yeah, so, that's, that's why we have so many different types of notation system that try to, you know. That's right, but, you know, <laughs> nobody yeah. uses them because they're really difficult to interpret and they, they're not sort of uh, standard or, or anything. So, yeah. so, the, so I, my guess would be, you know, let's try to kind of stay as close to the raw audio as possible. And with those, you know, those kind of joint embedding self-supervised learning techniques, basically those techniques, you know, we'll learn, uh, so let's say you take a segment of a musical piece, okay, or a segment of audio, and then the next segment of audio, and you try to train uh, Siamese nets, so the same architecture, to produce essentially identical representations for those two segments, just because they follow each other, okay? What the system is going, going to extract is a representation of that signal that the part that doesn't change between those two, those two segments, the part that is common. So if those two segments are only a few milliseconds, what the system is going to represent is the timber, essentially, maybe the pitch, okay? If the separation between those, those two segments, if those two segments are longer, let's say a, a note, okay? So you, you have two different notes. So now the pitch is not the same between the two, but the, the, the timber is the same, the, okay? The color of the sound is the same. Uh, now I use several seconds. Uh, what's common between the two is the the key, maybe the 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 melody, the scale, the mode, you know, things like that, right? And so you can imagine that using self-supervised learning with sort of increasingly large uh, segments of music and learning, training the system to basically learn a representation that doesn't change between those two segments will you know, as you increase the, the length of the segment, we'll drive the system to learn more and more abstract concepts about the, about the music, right? Uh, in the end, you can put like an entire phrase uh, and, and, you know, maybe the system will kind of abstract what the, what the piece uh, is about, you know, long-term. Like the, the question of how you learn sort of long-term dependencies in music is, is, a, is a big issue, right? Oh yeah, and and this is you know just related to another question that's popping up, as now we observe that music created 
by most models do not have an actual concept, say sentence or music structure phrase. How do you think this weak logical flow among the time axis can be addressed in the future using yeah, the Right, so I think this is still an open question. This is something uh, actually Gus and I have discussed when he was in New York last time. But um, I mean, I think it's still an open, an open question, but I'm sort of hopeful that those uh, self-supervised learning technique will help with this. Uh, you know, partly with the idea I just mentioned of sort of using increasingly large con contexts for um, for learning representations, partly also with uh, some ideas that have been floating around that uh, some of my postdocs and students are working on, where instead of uh, training the system to learn the same representation for two segments of, of audio or video or whatever it is, um, you 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 train you have a third network called the predictor that will try to predict the representation of the second segment from the representation of the first segment. Okay, so the way you go from, let's say a bar to another bar is by transforming the representation of that bar uh, into uh, that measure into, uh, into the representation of the second one using a, another neural net that transforms the, the representation. Now, the thing is, there is a, a bit of a, uh, an obstacle there, which is that that transformation has to depend on you know, your inspiration. I mean, the, there are many ways, right? If I, if I play an initial segment of music and I ask you to complete it, there's many, many ways that are compatible with what I just played. Uh, you, you, can, you can continue it in many ways that are perfectly fine. And so, and so the question is, how do you, again, how do you represent the uncertainty? How do you represent a set of possible continuations, not just a single one? Uh, and if you have kind of a, a joint embedding architecture that basically eliminates the, the variability between all those different options, um, then you only, have one, you only have one prediction to make. Uh, this is still a solved problem. I mean, until people have techniques to do this in the context of video or text or something like this, uh, I don't think you know you'll it'll be applicable to music, to music essentially. Still an open question. I think I think people are going to come up with things to do, you know, ways to do this over the next year or two. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll run out of time, but so so please allow me to close the questions and uh, just uh, you know combine the the, the current questions. Uh, maybe combine them too. Uh, so next question will be, do you think in the next few years, computer music research will still be mainly be driven by machine learning? And if so, how can we make computational expensive models for more accessible to more accessible to artists and to general audience? Well, uh, so the answer to the first question is absolutely yes. Okay, there is there's no question in my mind that uh, you know things like deep learning approaches are here to stay. They're not going to be, you know, they're going to be improved. Uh, you know, maybe five ten years from now, they they will look very different from what we see today. But the idea that you're going to build uh, a recognition system, image recognition, text, or whatever, by assembling parameterized modules and training them with an objective function, this is not going away. This is this is. This is going yeah. to stay with us for a long time. Um, uh, so that, that's point number one. Point number two is, I think, good news is that, you know, deep learning is getting ubiquitous. Uh, you know, of course, you know, you, to train a big deep learning system, you need a GPU in your, uh, in, in your, in your desktop machine, or you need to, you know, get time on AWS or, or you know, Google Cloud or whatever it is. Um, so that, you know, that can be a little taxing, but, you know, new processors, including for mobile devices, uh, now come out with uh, neural net accelerators. So I think, um, you know, you see now, uh, you know, essentially microcontroller class uh, chips um, that are based on the open source RISC V architecture, and they have a neural net accelerator with them. And the chips, you know, sell for two bucks. Um, you can have a development board for, you know, fifteen bucks. And uh, and those things are pretty powerful. You and you know, 
you're going to see more and more of those. Uh, you know, there, there is stuff coming out from Google also. The, I mean, the Magenta project has, has come up with things where, you know, you can basically use uh, neural net like computation to do sound synthesis and stuff like that. Um, and you're going to see a lot more, I think. Uh, there, there's some work also from, from Facebook on, on sound synthesis and um, kind of you know, style change for, for audio and source separation. All of this using uh, deep learning systems. They're running real time on the GPU card at the moment, but you know, soon you can kind of run this in real time on the mobile device and you know, an ARM processor with the uh, appropriate accelerators. So it could be kind of a compact format. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really accessible. Thank you for the vision. And um, the last question is about the future from Mujin. Uh, as a bad acoustic instrument player, um, so am I. <laughs> I also have been dreaming of developing or realizing musical inspirations in my heart with help of machine. Is there any type of music or digital creation that you could like to achieve in the future? with or without machine learning? Yeah, I mean, it's been a bit of my pipe dream. You know, I never had like the, the either the self-discipline or the, or the time or the will to kind of sit down and really kind of approach that problem seriously. But, uh, but that, that, that is, you know, a dream of mine, essentially, um, because I have the same issue, you know, I have, you know, technical limitations as, as a instrument player. And, uh, you know, my best instrument for improvising on jazz is whistling, essentially. Um, it sounds, you know, it sounds awful. I mean, I can do a pretty good whistle, but, you know, uh, the sound is not so great. So one of the things I've been working on, for example, is, uh, you know, essentially an audio pipeline that turns whistling into kind of decent sound, right? Uh, and sort of helps with, you know, pitch quantization and, and transitions and things like that. Uh, but uh, the problem with, uh, with whistling is that it's not as agile as fingers. So you can't, you can't really kind of change note as fast by whistling as, as you can with a, like a saxophone or something like that. Um, so, you know, we all have musical ideas in our mind and uh, we have a hard time kind of you know, getting them out because of the limit mechanical limitations of our bodies or the instruments we're, we're playing uh, or, you know, uh, other limitations. So the question is, how do we kind of use all the bandwidth that we have at our disposals, not just our 10 fingers, not just our breath uh, pressure, but perhaps our vocal tract, uh, perhaps our, or, you know, whistling abilities. Um, you know, I'm not going to whistle because I dry lips right now, but, um, <laughs> Thank you. uh, and, uh, yeah, that's the, I don't have an answer to that question, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm really interested in the answer, interested in the answer. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, for your time. And I guess through questions, we know that at least my take is computer music problem is, is maybe even harder, but we get uh, less data and fewer researchers and really need the help from the general machine learning community. And I guess today is, is a good start and uh, it's maybe a small step on yourself, but uh, maybe a good big step on the whole perspective. And uh, yeah, please join us in the rest of the, the, the conference and uh, you yeah. know, and also in the future that uh, combining your dream and David Whistle's dream through this, <laughs> your lifelong efforts. <laughs> um, just to, to everyone that, um, so about, you know, uh, please look at our, our schedule. We have a replay uh, about 11 hours later and, and then Yang will show up again to take another Q and A. This is to a comment update the, the time differences uh, all over the world. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Yan. Uh, we'll see you the rest of the conference. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention uh, and uh, for you know uh, putting up with my sort of amateurish uh, <laughs> work in computer music. But uh, uh,
this is really an, an exciting field, exciting uh, area. Looking forward for to the next, the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so everyone, please feel free to uh, raise a question here using the Q&A function. Um, and also uh, feel free to you know, open this closed caption. Um, there's a live transcript function, the CC button there. Yeah. And uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, night, or to everyone, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so maybe everyone is still, you know, composing the, the, the question. So uh, I'll fill in now and uh, ask, yeah, you, you talk about common sense, you know, in this self-supervised learning. In our early age, we developed this kind of rough, rough physical laws in our mind. And that's kind of related to common, one of the common sense. And, and what would be the correspondence in music domain? What is the common sense in music domain that you can imagine that um, we can pursue in computer music? So I think uh, you know common sense is sort of all the background knowledge we have about the constraints of the world, right? So if I if I which allows you to basically fill in the blanks for when you only have partial information. So if I if I say a very short sentence, I say something like. Uh, uh, John uh, picks up his bag and leaves the conference room. You can sort of picture the situation. And you can picture that John is probably a man because that's a man's name. He's, pro he's probably sitting, he's going to, you know, grab his bag on the, on the floor, kind of reach for, reach for it with his hand, close his hand around the handle, um, stand up, walk towards the door, open the door, leave the room. There's a lot of things you can infer from this also, because you, you know how the world works. You know that John cannot be in two places at the same time. So once he's left the room, he's not in the room anymore. You know that John probably does not fly because he's probably a man. It's a conference room, so he's probably at work. Um, his bag may have papers or a laptop in it or something like that. Um, there's a lot of information you know that you can fill in just with, from a few words because, because you know how the world works, right? And that's really what common sense is about. It's the, the enormous background information you have about how the world works. And as I said in my talk, it's probably not a collection of facts. It's probably a connection of models. models. Um, so common sense is you know, the, the ability to sort of uh, configure our prefrontal cortex to kind of imagine a situation and predict what's going to, what's going to happen in that situation. Uh, because the world is evolving or because we are taking a particular action. And that's what allows us to, uh, to plan. So I've been fond of saying that to some extent, the, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. Uh, so that, that's, uh, so now the question is, you know, what is the equivalent to common sense for music? And uh, I think uh, it, it's again, the ability to predict, right? So there's this interesting phenomenon that if a piece of music is too easily predictable, it's boring, right? And a lot of us who are involved in music are bored by a lot of music that a lot of people find interesting um, because maybe they don't have the same level of musical culture that uh, a lot of us here. Um, and so I don't know about you, but my taste in music kind of tend to gravitate towards relatively sophisticated music. And I get easily bored by kind of, you know, popular music and stuff like that. Um, but then if there is, you know, above a certain level of predictability, then it becomes chaos and, and you have a hard time kind of, you know, kind of making sense out of it. So to, uh, a, a trained ear, a, uh, you know, complex, uh, uh, you know, jazz solo by the, you know, the, the sort of latter period of John Coltrane, for example. Uh, for a lot of people, it just doesn't appeal to us because they just have no idea what this, you know, what the structure behind this is. Whereas, you know, if if you're if you're used to kind of listening to, uh, you know, 1960s uh, post bop improvisation, it does make sense. It evokes probably, you know, uh, emotions that would leave other people, 
um, you know, completely un unaffected, if you want. So, um, so what is what is common sense in that situation? Is is still the ability to predict, but but what makes uh, art in general interesting is that it's not completely predictable. It's it's it has some structure, but not too much. Yeah, the the prediction is quite you know characterized. Uh, next question is from our paper co-chair Xiao Xiao. Uh, for speech recognition, what about the prediction of super segmental features like intonation, prosody? Uh, seems like there are parallels with the continuous of music. Yeah, it's true. Although, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't speak any tonal language, but my understanding is that there, there is sort of uh, a number of tonal categories. Um, that, that are relatively discrete and identifiable, even though you know in practice you, it's it's kind of difficult to figure it out. Here is something that's interesting. I think in uh, uh, what happened in in speech recognition over the last uh, couple of decades, it used to be that uh, speech recognition systems were supervised at the level of a phone or phoneme, and mm -hmm. so people would come up with you know in English there is you know basically fifty some odd basic sounds. And you would try to uh, hand segment uh, speech signal and then train a classifier to do you know, your acoustic model to basically classify in one of those 50 categories or whatever it was. Um, and then people realized you know, the, the P, the, the, the plosive P in the context of different sets of vowels sounds completely different. Like the, the shape, mm -hmm. the spectral shape is completely different. So you, need, you don't need one P, you need like a whole collection of P depending on context. So the idea, you know, people came up with this idea of context-dependent phones, and if you try to figure out like how many of those basic sounds there is in English, it's about three thousand, and you can probably come up with ten thousand, and we still, you know, you can still make sense out of it. But of course, there is no way you can hand label or segment those things. So the the progress, uh, you know, of continuous speech recognition based on hidden Markov models and whatever acoustic model was at the time. Uh, was to basically train at the sequence level and let the system decide which of those 3,000 categories just occurred right now and, and build a, you know, a hidden Markov model that you know, basically says, if you have this sequence, it's that word, and using transducer, you know, finite state transducers and stuff like that, wasted finite state machines. Now, what, uh, what has happened in the last um, few years since the emergence of deep learning is that um, even that is kind of disappearing. You don't you don't have kind of acoustic categories anymore. Um, you basically have a giant neural net, and the neural net directly translates from essentially raw waveforms to character sequences, which is kind of amazing. And what's even more amazing is that those things are multilingual. It's the same neural net that you can use for, you know, English, French, and Chinese, um, uh, you know, Mandarin or whatever form, um, and and different dialects and and stuff like that, right? So. Uh, whether it's tonal or not, and the system learns its own, uh, you know, front end pre-processing. Um, it works a little better if you hardwire it, but it's not going to last very long. Uh, pretty soon, I think um, you, you can learn directly from uh, wave, the, the, from waveform. There is uh, quite a bit of uh, pre-training now taking place, uh, self-supervised pre-training of the type that I that I mentioned. This sort of several several examples. So there is a, a Facebook piece of work called wave 2 vec that sort of uh, Mm. Um, does this? It's open source. You can you can just download it. There's actually several incarnations of it. Um, one of them is, is fairly recent. So so we're moving away. So speech recognition is moving away from so sort of discrete tokens um, at, at the intermediate level between uh, the the signal and the and the the transcription essentially. Yeah, one of the correspondence I can think of is in music, different instruments may have shared um, articulation and expression. And this also can be you know, learned automatically rather than hand label. Uh, next question is, thank you for your talk. Could you please elaborate further on the connection between the first session uh, of your first section of your talk about the EWI and the second section about deep learning and machine learning. Okay, I wish I could claim that there was you know a deep connection between them. The only connection is that you know I'm behind both of them, but uh, uh, 
but right now I have not yet figured out uh, how to use uh, uh, ML, DL, et cetera, uh, for the purpose that I was talking about, which is sort of personalizing the, the sound of, a, you know, of an electronic wind instrument, for example. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm working on on my you know, copious spare time. Uh, essentially, COVID has actually been kind of uh, helpful for me because I spend more time in my uh, house in New Jersey and my workshop, and I can I can spend a little bit more time working on those things. But um, but I you know what I like to do is uh, have some sort of uh, synthesis engine that um, you know runs on a microcontroller that uses perhaps uh, sort of neural net based uh, synthesis. So I've been you know I've. I've been sort of having those ideas, you know, going back a long time in the 90s. In the 90s, I had a paper with uh, a colleague, Patrice Simard, who's uh, uh, spent a long time after that at Microsoft Research and, and now has a, a startup. And the uh, the paper that we had together was called Reverse TDNN. So this is this was basically an architecture of a convolutional net, which which you flip all the arrows. So you start from a representation of a sequence, and what the system does is that it synthesizes the sequence. And we tested this on, you know, basically synthesizing handwriting, uh, you know, like a pen trajectory for handwriting, which was not a particularly interesting application, but it was, uh, the, the idea behind this was, you know, can you train a neural net to synthesize sequences? Of course, now there's a lot of work on, on, on this kind of thing where, you know, a lot of uh, people are working on neural nets for sequence uh, synthesis and for sound synthesis. Uh, I mean, certainly there's, you know, um, you know, the, you know our, our friends at Google, Doug, you know, Doug Eck and, you know, with magenta and all that stuff, and they, they even that kind of wrapped into a Raspberry Pi like like thing. So uh, this is, I think, where where I'd like to go, and you know, whether the adaptivity. So you know, there are ways to sort of infer the the shape of the vocal track of uh, of a of a person by you know sending pulses basically to your vocal track and then listening for the echo, and you can sort of identify the you know, spectral response of your vocal track and maybe use that to personalize the sound. So that's been sort of an idea I've been playing with for, I've been thinking about for a long time, but haven't actually kind of uh, done anything about. Like if, you know, if anybody wants to collaborate with this, I'd be, I'd be happy actually. I only have so limited time to, to uh, devote to this. Uh, next question, very technical from Groshan. Uh, what kinds of augmentations would you make for the contrastive methods with sound or music? How might limiting or alternatively overdoing the available augmentations be useful under different circumstances? For example, a network that is trained to recognize the same sound forward and backwards versus one that is invariant to pitch shifts. How do you choose your augmentations? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. So it depends what you want to be uh, invariant to, right? So yeah. first of all, I want to make something really clear. Uh, what I'm excited about is not contrastive methods, right? The stuff I talked about at the end, Big Craig, uh, Barlow Twins, uh, and you know before the BYOL and things like this, they are non-contrastive joint embedding methods, and I find those much more exciting than the contrastive methods because the contrastive methods are really expensive, and I think they have some limitations that. Uh, you know, we we're not going to be able to kind of go past because of you know some sort of theoretical reasons. So um, so I'm much more interested in the non-contrastive methods, uh, the the you know VCRAG being kind of the the, the best example. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, very often the way those things are are trained in image recognition is that you take an image and you distort it using a data augmentation process, which does not change the content and the nature of the image. And then you train the two networks to produce essentially identical outputs, right? Um, now, this works if what you are interested in is classifying, uh, if the downstream task you're interested to do is invariant with respect to those transformations. And so it, it works for image recognition, category level image recognition, because you want to be invariant to illumination and details of pose and, uh, and things like that. Uh, now, if you want to do instrument recognition in music, yeah, maybe you want to be independent of pitch and, and intonation and phrasing and all that stuff, right? But, uh, but most of the time, what you want to do is, um, is maybe transcription, you know, polyphonic transcription or, or something else. Uh, and, and, and there, you want a representation that is 
you know, that keeps all the information about uh, that you're interested in. So what you're not interested in, so can we use those self-supervised learning techniques to basically eliminate irrelevant information, which would be, you know, quasi-random variation of the, of the waveform, the phase, you know, the precise phase doesn't really matter uh, as far as perception is, is concerned. Um, uh, you know, but preserve things like vibrato is something that, you know, we perceive the, the, the quasi-randomness in the, in the pitch in human voice, for example, is one of the things that makes uh, synthesized human voice uh, sound realistic. If you, if you synthesize, if you have a really good voice synthesizer that synthesizes a fixed pitch, it sounds completely unnatural. It has to have a little bit of kind of quasi-random variation of the pitch. Um, and so all of those things need to be preserved in the, in the representation, but the thing that is irrelevant needs to be eliminated. And what is that? Um, not clear? And it seems like what kind of augmentation if we have a clear, well, knowledge about music that can help us? Yeah, I mean, it's not clear that you need augmentation at all. You might need, you might be able to get away by just, you know, predicting, predicting what's going to happen next. So give mm -hmm. a segment of music, you know, blank out a piece of it and then train, uh, you know, one of the joint embedding architecture, one of which sees the visible parts and the other one sees the masked uh, part and you learn a joint embedding of those two things. Um, so, you know, have a segment of uh, a music and then, uh, so perhaps you, those two things can be successive in time, um, you know, train a joint embedding architecture to find a common code to two successive pieces of uh, either a short signal or uh, a bar or uh, a whole, you know, phrase or, or something. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Um, uh, we got uh, more questions popping in, and uh, uh, next two questions are about, uh, you know, push deep learning uh, forward to embrace creativity, and, and I guess this is really the frontier. And at this time, you know, um, we have about 10 minutes left, and we have Roger here. And I guess it's a good time to let Roger in and have a panel discussion. I will, you know, continue, um, you know, read your questions and, uh, and maybe we have um, a good dialogue here. Uh, Roger. Sounds great. I'm back. I decided to join Jan in outer space. It's I'm space. in the International Space Station. Fantastic <laughs> yeah. idea. Okay, the difference I think between your picture and mine is that I actually took that picture. <laughs> 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 whereas, whereas this is not a picture. I'm actually in the International Space You're Station. You're in the International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I have a, I have a question. If, uh, if we don't have a, a definite plan here, um, in, in some work I've been doing uh, with, with students and deep networks and sequence learning. One, one of the things that's really struck me is um, how poorly it seems that we've been able to get uh, deep networks to sort of form the kinds of abstractions that at least musicians uh, would form. And um, I mean, one example I was thinking of is uh, just if, if, I'm, if I'm listening to, to uh, tonal music or, or a pop music melody, then I'll form, you know, one set of predictions. If I'm listening to atonal music, um, then then you know my predictions immediately will be completely different. But if you if you train a system on you know a big a big mix of that stuff, then the, then the predictions are just kind of a a, a blur of yep. seem to be a blur of the two. And I, right. I just wonder um, what thoughts you have about that, and you know what what research uh, to look at. So I think you put your finger on the sort of the main technical question we need to solve. And, uh, you know, I, I could only kind of brush that topic uh, in my talk, but essentially, you know, whether you apply uh, deep learning to things like, you know, music prediction or video prediction or, you know, speech signal prediction, language, et cetera, you have the problem of representing uncertainty in the prediction. The fact that uh, if I give you an initial video segment, there are many ways, plausible ways to continue it. If I give you a segment of music, there are many plausible ways to continue it. And as you said, depending on which kind of style of music you're, we're talking about, those, those continuations may be very, very different from each other. And if you train a prediction, a prediction system 
in sort of a traditional way as a regressor or classifier or whatever, the system basically can, I mean, particularly for regression, it can only make one prediction in the end. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, particularly if the output is kind of a high dimensional continuous type uh, thing like a video frame or, or a piece of audio or something like this, right? It can only make one prediction. It's got an output and it's gonna make one prediction. And if you train it with something like least square, it's the best thing it can do is predict the average of all the possible futures, which is a blurry mess. Um, you know, if uh, you're training a system to predict, you know, the next frame in this uh, in the vi this video of me talking, and I can choose to move my head to the left or to the right, and the best thing the system can do is predict the average of me going to the right and to the left, the right and to the left, which is a blurry version of me. So, we, and it's not a good prediction. Um, so. So the question is, you know, how, how do we get machines to represent multiple possible predictions without kind of predicting blurry messes? And so I only know two methods. Um, one method uh, essentially consists in parameterizing the predictions with a latent variable. So as you vary the latent variable over a set, your prediction varies over the set of plausible predictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so GANs are an example of this where your, your latent variable is sampled VAEs are an, another example, conditional VAEs in particular. Um, and there is you know, various other kind of latent variable models um, that where the, the latent variable is there to basically pick up the slack, uh, contain the information about the prediction that is not present in the observed uh, variable in the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are technical difficulties with this. I've been really sort of interested in this kind of architecture before. And the technical difficulty is that you have to minimize the information capacity of the latent variable. Otherwise, the latent variable basically ends up um, doing all the prediction and that's not mm. very useful. And your system ignores the observation basically. Um, and we don't really know how to do this. So the alternative is to basically say, forget about prediction altogether. We're gonna use the joint embedding architectures, right? So uh, the past is gonna be run through some neural net and the thing to be predicted is gonna be run through another neural net. And because this other neural net has invariance properties, you can change the value of this thing to be predicted and the output of this neural net is going to be constant, mm -hmm. which means that, uh, you know, for a given observed X, there's going to be multiple Y's that are compatible uh, with mm -hmm. that X because the output of that second neural net doesn't change. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a way of handling multimodality through the invariance properties of uh, an encoder network, if you want. Um, and, and that's what those joint embedding architectures do. Um, which is why I'm kind of so, so basically what those things do is that they eliminate the detailed information that is not, uh, you know, relevant for the extracting the abstract uh, concepts, if you want, from the, from, from the data. Um, the cost of this is that you can't use this to predict, uh, <laughs> or at least not easily, right? So yeah. what you would have is a music listener that understands the structure of music, but not a composer. And that's what most people are, right? I mean, a lot of people appreciate music, but are not able to compose music to save their lives. Um, so maybe that's a different problem that needs to be solved separately. Um, but that, that may be the way to kind of learning hierarchical high level concepts of, you know, tonality, scale, key, um, chords, you know, whatever. Do you, do you think generation that way could it, I mean, can you do generation by some kind of gradient descent to, to um, sort of uh, solve for, for outputs, maybe, maybe randomize and then, and then do gradient sent, descent to um, form something plausible? Yeah, I mean, it's probably one way that human composers actually work. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a composer, but um, you know, you get some inspiration and inspiration could be some random noise or bird song or whatever, right? So it's something you hear from, you know, other musicians. And that sort of basically kind of biases your drawing of your internal latent variable. And then you run this through, you know, kind of a generative process. So, uh, you know, imagine in your head, you have some function that parameterizes the set of all music that you can apprehend. And, uh, and, and by varying this latent variable, you can generate all the possible musics, right? Now you have to pick one of those you know, values of this latent variable, and maybe that's what inspiration is about. But then the music you're gonna generate is not gonna be perfect. So you're gonna have to kind of fine tune it. You're gonna have to like, go through it and say like, oh, you know, it'd be better if I change the rhythm right there and maybe do a tonal change or 
like you know blah 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 right um and and that that maybe you know this kind of constraint satisfaction uh is is perhaps where you know where the the, the skill of a of a composer of written music uh, uh really matters but then what about improvisation like you have to do this in real time now um that so this is one of the things that fascinates me about the intellectual exercise of improvisation, which is the fact that you're, you've trained your, 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 your brain well enough that you, know, you can kind of you know, spontaneously, with uh, inspiration coming from people you play with or, or other things, or your mood uh, of the time, or, or you know, how many whiskeys you drank just before, um, you know, of, of sort of you know, generating different music, uh, interesting uh, different music at that in real time. I've, I find that process fascinating. I, I'm, I'm amazed that it can be done so well. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, your, your description of composition really resonates with me. And uh, uh, it seems very plausible um, that, you know, at, of course, I think brains are much more complicated than this, but, but there's, there's uh, uh, some, some resonance there. Uh, I, I think improvisation is is much uh, uh, much much more is based on on retrieval and and reflex uh, as opposed to conscious planning. Uh, most uh, the the great improvisers I talk to say, you know, learn learn all this all the theory, study all the theory, um, and then when you get on stage, forget everything you've ever learned <laughs> and don't even think about it. And I Just think play, that's right. I mean, yeah, I mean that's what that's what everybody says, and and you know I, I certainly believe that. And and that's why you can also recognize improvisers, right? Because they have their 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 motifs and their their style, yeah. and and you can recognize them by the sound just from one note, but you can also re you know recognize them from. Uh, I have a, a friend, a jazz musician, uh, a sax player in New York called uh, Joel Fram, who's. Uh, which was a uh, tenor sax uh, player, and um, someone played a, a game once on 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 Facebook where they, they posted you know obscure recordings from a whole bunch of, of sax players, and asked like who is this, and then gave a list of sax players and said like you know match the recording to the sax player, but there were more you know more players and there were recordings, and I was the only one to recognize Joel because the reason was <laughs> when I was. Uh, the early years I was at NYU, I was, uh, I didn't live in the city, I live in New Jersey, and I had a, an apartment in New York, and I would teach my, my class late at night, because the graduate class at NYU were late at night, and then I would go to the jazz club where you had this weekly gig, and, you know, then have dinner with him at the, at the break, that's how we became friends, but I was there every week, you know, for like, you know, three or four years, mm. um, and so I, his style was really sort of ingrained in my, it was trio form, so it's very free, and his style really kind of was engraved in my uh, in my sort of you know musical brain. Yeah. Guess yeah. what? <laughs> Great conversation. I, I I wish I we could uh, continue this. Um, actually, uh, we are running out of time, and uh, though we have you know unsolved questions, there actually there are pretty much all covered in, in your conversation. Uh, maybe I will just ask the last one that um, um, may not quite touch, but touch a little bit in, in Roger's um, Q&A session is, thank you for the amazing talk. Music generation models nowadays heavily depend on statistical learning, and it is difficult to evaluate the models with objectively um, measures since music appreciation is highly subjective. Do you have any suggestions on, on how can we improve the evaluation methods to better compare the generated results? Unfortunately, I don't. This is a completely unsolved problem in my opinion. Uh, there are people, so in the, in the computer vision community, uh, there, there are people who do, I mean, not computer vision, but sort of image generation, right? Uh, you use GANs to generate images. And of course, you can show them to people and sort of have them rate uh, the quality of the images. Uh, and then, you know, people in the community use something called the uh, inception score, uh, which basically consists in, you know, taking a pre-trained convolutional net, which is the inception architecture from Google from several years ago, and then run the image through uh, that system, and then ask the system, does this look like a good image? This is not 
a neural net that was trained, you know, is not a discriminator. In and in again, it's a separate neural net. Uh, and people use this because they have no other way of evaluating, but it's an absolutely terrible um, evaluation. It's, it's the worst thing you could imagine. Um, because uh, why would a, a ConvNet trained for image recognition give you any, uh, you know, good evaluation for the, the quality of an image? Uh, so the sad news is there is no good way of evaluating a generative uh, model uh, other than by subjective uh, evaluation by, uh, by people. Uh, or by a downstream task for which you have uh, a non-ambiguous metric, which is what people do for self-supervised learning, for example. Um, but what does that mean for you know music composition? Like you know, uh, it's not clear to me uh, what uh, what you could do. Perhaps you know you could test the system with the same kind of test that you you test uh, kind of you know music theory students. You know, like use the representation learned by the system and ask it like, can you tell me the key in which this Thing is being played. Can you tell me the instruments that are used? Um, can you tell me the the the, key, the the rhythm signature? Can you tell me the chord that was just played? Um, you know things like that. So if your system is capable of uh, of doing this with minimal training, then probably it has abstracted all the kind of required information and perhaps would be able to generate good music. Okay. Cool. So basically, turning the music generation into a representation learning problem and then yeah. use that representation to do MIR and test whether the yeah. representation is good for it. Yeah. I mean, it's all about representation, right? If you can learn good representations of music, then you have a way of uh, first appreciating, you know, the music, cl classifying it, you know, doing information retrieval, etc. But you also have a parameterization uh, through a latent variable, a parameterization of all music. So all music that you trained on, all styles that you trained on. Uh, and, and so you may have uh, kind of the essential piece to uh, music composition and, and generation. All right. Oh, I, I was, uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've also in, in uh, some of our evaluations um, uh, generated a lot of stuff and, and then looked at uh, just general statistics and sort of any, anything we could find to say, you know, is the stuff that we're generating um, uh, detectably uh, different from uh, maybe the stuff that we're trying to imitate. And that's kind of a, it, it doesn't really tell you whether you're doing a good, good job or not, but it's, if, if the things that you're measuring are independent enough from the, the techniques you're using to generate, it's it's maybe a, a sanity check uh, just to see if if in the process of trying to learn a musical style you've actually uh, injected some very strong bias that makes it obviously different from what your what your goal is. But yeah, I, I tell all of my students if if you have a great evaluation function for music, that's that's the basis for a, a music composer itself. Uh, right. it, you just search for anything that satisfies that function and you're, you're golden. Right, but you have to be careful to kind of preserve creativity, right? Uh, so uh, interesting story, I, I, uh, during my undergrad, I took a AI class where the final project was, you know, supposed to be about search and stuff like that. And what I did was write a, a, a counterpoint composition uh, program, uh, which, you know, satisfied all the rules of counterpoint uh, that, that, you know, for, for two part, uh, two part counterpoint um, and was doing uh, tree exploration. So basically we generate multiple, uh, you know, multiple notes uh, for the two parts and then kind of figure out what sequence would satisfy all the rules and, you know, kind of like a chess player essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the, so it's kind of this idea of like, you know, search for something that satisfies the constraints or et cetera. And this is the negation of all creativity in music, right? Because you know, this basically optimizes some value function that you came up with. And you know, this is not what creativity is all about. It's kind of ex escaping those, uh, those constraints, right? And breaking them when necessary, so. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were gonna say that the output of your system was all tonic, just play uh, C was, whole it notes. It was basically all tonic, it was incredibly boring. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
yeah, and, and, and I guess the, the all C is also the general cadence uh, for music and also this great keynote. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, let's thank um, Yan again, Roger. Thank you. Uh, it's a great conversation. And uh, yeah, I'll see you both and see you all uh, in other sessions at the conference. Thank you again. Thanks. Guys. That, was, that was really fun. Yes.